So a couple, couple more topics here I want to touch before I let you go. Um, one is myocarditis risk. This is something I, I've actually only really paid attention to this through, through you and Vinay Prasad and um, a couple other people. But, um, you know, what do you have to say about the myocarditis risk from taking the mRNA vaccines and how it compares to the risk uh, from getting COVID and how different people should act on that risk, if at all, based on, um, who, you know, their gender and their age and so forth? It's a very good, nuanced, and complicated question. And the truth is, you know, Vinay has been diving into this stuff, but the basic premise is this. It appears that there's an age-correlated and sex-correlated risk of myocarditis, um, and it's typically in those teenage years with boys where the risk seems to be the highest. And even then, the risk isn't that absolutely high. It may be one in 5,000, it may be one in 1,200, but it's not zero. Now, what is myocarditis? Well, really it's inflammation of the heart muscle and or the lining around the heart. And that'll, that'll land you in the hospital in most cases, actually. So you're talking about a kid who had nothing going on. You gave them a vaccine and now they're in the hospital. So that, that's a big deal in the sense that you don't discount it. You don't go, oh, that's nothing. Don't worry about it, right? Because parents will worry about it. Mm-hmm. Now, the question is what's causing it? There's been speculation online like, oh, maybe they're injecting the vaccine into a vein instead of into the muscle and it's going directly to the heart and so on. That doesn't really make sense because the vast majority of myocarditis cases happen after the second dose, which implies an immune priming mechanism, meaning Mm -hmm. the first dose teaches the immune system something. The second time it happens, immune system responds And there's collateral damage from the immune response in the heart. And you actually see this with the smallpox vaccine they were giving in the military. There was a rate of myocarditis. So this is not an unprecedented thing. And it's not specific to spike protein toxicity or any of the misinformation that you can sometimes see. So looking at this higher risk group, these young boys, you could say, well, okay, what's the risk of COVID itself causing myocarditis? Now, this is where blue church and red church all disagree. Mm -hmm. Thesis tribe will say, well, no, COVID is much worse based on these data. And Red Church will say, well, no, actually, these data say that vaccination has a higher risk of generating myocarditis than natural COVID. And it really depends on how you look at the data and the confounders, because a lot of the studies looking at this are looking at confirmed COVID positive patients who end up hospitalized. Well, those patients are already sicker. They've already been diagnosed. You're not including the right denominator, which is everyone who's been infected with COVID, whether they've been diagnosed or not, the true infection rate. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. It's a hard number to grab. But when you start estimating it, you start to see that myocarditis from COVID is actually less than you think. So then it starts becoming a question of, well, is there a benefit risk thing here? Now, here's my take. This is my editorial and know that I'm biased towards vaccine in general, but I also am biased towards reason. So I feel like if you have a young boy in that age group, consider a single dose of vaccine. If that kid has already been infected with COVID, you could consider no vaccine or a single dose. Um, You could consider spreading the dose out, although I have not seen the data on the efficacy of preventing myocarditis by by spacing dose out 12 weeks or so. I think Marty McCary is more familiar with that. Um, So there isn't a one size fits all there, but I think that the benefit of vaccinating kids is not just preventing myocarditis from natural COVID. It's preventing COVID. It's preventing some degree of transmission. It's preventing the MISC, which is that multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children, which seems to be less prominent with Delta and Omicron than it was with the earlier strains, which is good. So it's less compelling and preventing whatever long COVID kids may get, which seems to be you know, people, kids will say, oh, I still have symptoms. It's hard to really tease out what's going on there. So it's a nuanced question that it's not wrong for parents to ask, but I'm not in the camp that's like, well, then we shouldn't vaccinate kids or, mm. you know, but one thing to remember Coleman is like in Europe, they are much less aggressive about vaccinating kids in Sweden and other countries in Europe. They don't even give Moderna, which has a higher rate of myocarditis, probably because it's a higher dose 
to anyone under 30. So we don't necessarily have the answers here in the U.S. Other countries are doing it differently. So there's room for discussion. Yeah. And then and last I had looked at it, Germany and France were recommending Pfizer instead of Moderna to young men because the myocarditis, whatever is true of the actual risk level, it seemed that Pfizer was doing better than, than Moderna on that score. Yes. And, and, the, and that's simple public health, right? You have two vaccines. They're both pretty effective. Moderna is a little more effective, but you have a low risk population of young people. Why not give them the vaccine that has less myocarditis by a factor of two or three, mm. right? Why not? And that's, that's what they're saying. In the United States, it seems like we have trouble doing that math or thinking in that kind of nuance. Our public health apparatus is much more like, here you go. The fact that the public health apparatus never recognized natural infection as an exemption, say, for getting a full three doses of vaccine generated a ton of mistrust and, and, and natural resentment and reactance, which I think was a big yeah. mistake. And it, that was a close vote internally. Right. Um, how, I haven't been paying attention to the CDC's health messaging on the myocarditis question, but ha have they walked this line in the right way or have they just labeled this misinformation, any conversation about this, put it in I the Joe that Rogan cancel it category? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. Which that's going to work. Right. Um, I haven't seen exactly CDC's messaging on this, but I would say that's probably in line with what most public health authorities are saying, which is uh, myocarditis is a rare reversible uh, risk. Um, you should be more worried about COVID. It shouldn't factor into your considerations. That's really how they see it. And I think that's, I don't think that is how parents are going to feel. Many parents are going to feel about it, especially if they're in red church, right? And if you start talking about mandating vaccines for kids and then that kid gets myocarditis, you're getting into really tricky territory. Now, regular childhood vaccines have rare side effects that can be quite bad right? So you can have very like one in a million type of things, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura where your platelets drop, which usually doesn't kill you. It's reversible usually in kids, but like, you know, one in 200,000 with MMR, one in 250,000. But we mandate those vaccines for kids because the community benefit of those vaccines seems to outweigh these rare individual risks. It's kind of like a, we have a social contract around that. Now with COVID vaccines, the social contract isn't clear because these kids are not huge vectors, it seems. They're not dying in droves, although they can. So it's more like, well, can we allow a little bit of latitude here, right? And that's just a question. 